So, so this is joint work with Richard Chow and Philippe Golay. Um, so just a, a brief outline. Of, first, I want to just explain what we mean by inference detection, because of course inference is a, a sort of um, ambiguous term. I'll talk about our technique and then um, describe how it can be used to detect bias. And then if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about how you might use inference detection to do better access control. Okay. So I want to start with just a couple of examples. So this is a document you can find on the web today. It's an FBI document that's been declassified. Um, and in the process of declassifying it, you know, certain information has been redacted. Right? So if you, if you look at it quickly, you can't tell immediately who it's about. Right? It's the redacted family. But there's a lot of other information in there. Right? We can extract some keywords on Saudi, magnet, half-brother. And if we enter these into Google, at least at the time we took this screenshot, uh, the, the first page is all up in line. So, so you might say that it's likely that someone who sees that document is going to um, infer that it's actually about the Bin Laden family, even though those words don't appear anywhere. Um, one more example that we'll refer to later. This is a screenshot. I apologize, you can't read this at all. It's a, a, a scan from Valerie Plame's book. So Valerie Plame was the, um, the covert uh, CIA agent whose identity was leaked sometime during the Bush administration. So then she wrote a book, and the CIA redacted chunks of it. So this is the chapter where she's talking about her first tour of duty with the CIA. And you can't you know, immediately <coughs> tell where that tour of duty was because they've redacted, and they say redacted tour. Uh, but again, there is a lot of stuff that she does say and that hasn't been redacted. She talks about it being in Europe. She complains about the heat and the traffic and you know, all sorts of things that seemingly are pretty non-identifying. Uh, but again, uh, at least we took the screenshot, Athens, Greece is the top two hits and that is where her first uh, tour of duty was. So again, it looks like an inference could be made based on the content remaining there. And there are lots more examples like this. Um, the, uh, the U.S. government had a short-lived website that they, they created for the purpose of demonstrating the presence of um, nuclear weapons in Iraq, but it was quickly removed when it was realized that uh, it could be used to infer how to make such weapons. And there are all sorts of bloggers who have you know, tried to maintain anonymity in their blogs, but they've revealed enough to be identified. Um, one kind of well-known example is this blog that was called The Washingtonian, and the, the blogger revealed that she was working for a Midwestern senator. She revealed her alma mater and a few other things, and it was very easy to... Um, to identify her based on that. So, so slightly more formally, the problem that we're looking at is that when you share a document with someone, they don't just have the document, right? They have some other reference knowledge. <coughs> they have just information that they know, and they have the web, they have you know, all sorts of resources, and that can lead to unintended inferences. So, so the challenge here, or one of the challenges here, is to figure out how to model that reference knowledge as, as well as you can, so that you can anticipate these inferences and so maybe uh, you know, protect the content better. Okay, um, so, so to put this in sort of the more general DLP set setting, data loss prevention setting, what we do is we take as input a privacy policy, which is probably pretty coarse information. It's probably just um, you know, sensitive topics you want to protect, like, like Bin Laden in that first example, or Greece in that, in that other example. Uh, so you've got a, a, some coarse information about sensitive topics. Um, we also require a knowledge corpus, which was web and the web in those past examples, but it could be a, a, an internal corpus. We'll talk about some examples later where that's more appropriate. And what the, the algorithm does is it uses association mining to output um, keywords that are closely associated with those sensitive topics. And that could then allow you to um, you know, program your content monitor that's looking at content on the network and trying to flag sensitive bits uh, and help it do a better job. Okay. So I just want to briefly mention some related work. Um, again, I mentioned association mining. Well, there, you know, there's a, a lot of work that's been done in association rule mining, particularly in the structured data settings or databases. Um, they're looking for rules of the form A implies B, where A and B are usually um, uh, you know, goods in a grocery store, for example, or you know, products, that type of thing. Um, and they focus on high support rules, so meaning rules that are satisfied by many records in the database. And for privacy, that, that may not make a whole lot of sense, right? Privacy is kind of a needle in the haystack type of problem, so even if a rule doesn't have high support, it still may be a privacy problem. 
Um, and another thing, another point to make is if you are using a large corpus like the web, it's really kind of hard to baseline you know, what means um, high support. Uh, the, the other thing I want to point out is that the way we use the web here is very much inspired by what the NLP community has been doing to um, you know, use the web to model human knowledge and disambiguate um, text. Okay, so, so what's our approach? It's actually very simple. Um, so first we need to get a, a candidate pool of keywords that may or may not be related to that sensitive topic. You know, they may or may not be related to Finlan. <coughs> so, so one way to get that initial pool is just you know, enter the sensitive topic into Google, um, take the top X hits and, and scrape those for, for candidate keywords. Then again, you know, this is going to give you a lot of false positives, so the work is figuring out which of those keywords really do have something to do with your sensitive topic. So for, for that step, what we're, what we're really interested in is the likelihood that someone who sees those keywords is going to think of the sensitive topic, right? Um, so you can, you can approximate that on the web by looking at the number of web pages that have those keywords uh, and also have the sensitive topic. So that's, that's really that conditional probability up there. Um, and that we can estimate with two search engine queries. Um, so one for the keywords that you're interested in and just note the number of pages um, that you get in return, the number of hits. Don't actually look at the content of them, just note the number of pages. And then a second query for those, those keywords with the sensitive topic. And again, note the number of pages. Okay. And then that ratio, the ratio of those two hit counts, is, uh, is what we're using um, to gauge the strength of the inference. Okay. So in that Valerie Plame example, uh, we got um, over 59,000 pages for those, that sequence of terms. Um, and for that same sequence of terms with Greece, we got um, over 42,000, so we get a confidence of 0.72. So, okay, so very simple. Um, so, of course, you can't stop there, right? I mean, how do you know if these results are any good? How do you know if your confidence measure is, is any good? Um, so, so we've done some experiments in a couple of different domains trying to get at um, how accurate these results are. So I wanted to talk about those um, quickly. So uh, when, we, when we started this work, we went out and did a number of interviews talking to people who deal with sensitive data in, in different domains. And, and this was a couple of years ago now. Actually, Dirk was on some of these interviews, so maybe it was three. Anyway, it was a while ago now. <laughs> so, um, and in the healthcare space, folks were really struggling with HIPAA compliance, HIPAA and other privacy legislation. And what they had interpreted that legislation to mean was that there are basically three categories of information that need to be protected. Um, one is um, HIV or AIDS. You know, anything about the patient's HIV status, for example. Um, drug or alcohol use and mental health. So, so the folks that we talked to knew that they needed to go beyond looking for the obvious keywords, like looking for HIV or looking for alcoholism in a medical record. Um, so they were actually maintaining long lists of um, medications commonly prescribed for those diseases, um, psychiatrist names that pertains to mental health uh, symptoms even, um, and then they would, um, you know, redact things in the medical records. When they had to produce a medical record, they would first redact it uh, against this list. So, of course, it's very time-consuming and, and potentially error-prone. So we wanted to understand how our technique might help in this setting. So, so here's, here's a small experiment <coughs> that we did. Um, using a sensitive topic, HIV, so just, just a portion of one, you know, one of the things that they have to redact for. Um, so this, uh, this is the, the output. This is about, I think, 73 or so terms, the top 73 or so terms that we got. Um, again, we followed the algorithm I just described. We you know, first issued a, a, a web query for HIV, got around 2,300 terms, and then ranked them by confidence using that process of generating two queries and, and taking the ratio. So a lot of these look reasonable, at least, at least the first two look reasonable, right? Two, two strains of HIV are at the top, confidence one. Uh, if you go down a little bit, you've got some drug names, etrovirine, uh, infuvertide. Uh, but, so we want to get a sense of how good these results really are. So we actually um, had a medical doctor who has a, a lot of HIV patients, HIV positive patients, look at these, these results. Um, he gave us a precision of a little over 75%. Um, and one interesting thing is that, we, well, we think this may be a, 
an underestimate because a lot of things that he thought weren't correct inferences, I think if, if we had a chance to explain to him, I, I think it would have made sense to him. That, but there were things that you wouldn't see in a medical record, things like um, websites about AIDS or um, the UN AIDS effort. There were just things that were really kind of out of context for him. So, so it, I mean, this also sort of indicates how hard it is to measure precision. I mean, inference is sort of, you know, in the eye of the beholder. Um, okay, and what about recall? So, for the same reason, recall is pretty hard to estimate, right? There, there isn't um, a comprehensive list of HIV inferences to, to work off of and take as the, the ground truth. So, so one thing that we've looked at to try and get some sense of recall is stability. So, meaning, you know, we, we've got this initial pool of keywords. If there's an inference that not that's not in that pool of keywords, we're just obviously not going to find it, right? So, so how sensitive is that pool of keywords to, um, you know, the cutoff that we give, the number of documents that we take um, as a result of our, our Google query or, or whatever? Um, so the interesting thing here is what you see in this curve is that for various confidence cutoffs, there does seem to be a diminished return after around 10 source documents. Right? We're just not finding a lot more inferences. So. So at least within the constraints of this approach, it looks like for a fairly small number of source documents, for a fairly small training set, we're kind of getting the most of the, um, the algorithm. Okay. Um, one other experiment I want to talk about, um, this one is interesting because um, it demonstrates when you might want to not rely exclusively on the web. So, so a lot of folks are um, concerned about intellectual property leaking out of the organization, right? Um, so, so again, when we, when we talked to people who were dealing with this process, they were pretty much doing it all manually. Again, trying to you know, list all the um, companies they were negotiating with or uh, new products under development, all, you know, all that type of thing. And again, you know, manually constructing such a list and using that to flag, say, emails uh, leading the organization. So, so again, we wanted to try and simulate um, <coughs> this type of setting and understand how how our technique could potentially help. Um, so, so our simulation um, uses the, the Enron email data set, which is around 500,000 emails um, sent from Enron uh, during a, a four-year period. And the sensitive topic that we cooked up, again, this is you know, very artificial, but um, one sensitive topic that we looked at is Wharton. So, so imagine you're Enron, and for some reason, you really don't want to reveal that you have this um, relationship with the Wharton School of Business for some reason. Um, so, so what do you what do you use to, to flag emails going out? How do you know, um, how do you detect if an email is about Wharton or not? Well, you can certainly look for the keyword Wharton. That will, that will catch some things. Um, maybe you know that Wharton's at the University of Pennsylvania, so you could also even look for that. Uh, but pretty quickly, right, you run out of ideas uh, for what to look for. So, so we did basically the same, you know, the same thing as before. But this time we trained on half of the Enron corpus, so we used that half of the corpus to get our initial pool of keywords. And then for evaluating the confidence, we used the other half of the corpus um, and the web as well. So here's some results, um, so the top 40 results in, in confidence order. Of course, this is not very helpful, so let's, let's sort them. So this is you know, manually sorted. Uh, so you get a lot of things that look reasonable, professors, um, contact info for people at Wharton. Um, other business schools, okay, that's a little bit of a weak association. And there are a bunch of things um, that we think are probably just errors, false positives. We can't explain them. Uh, but just to, to hopefully make this use case more clear, um, here's an example of an email that you would be able to flag with these keywords, but um, you might not otherwise, because it doesn't actually mention Wharton anywhere. Um, so it's, it's from this person, Francis Diebold at Enron. It does talk about Philadelphia. There's a UPenn uh, address. And using the Enron corpus, these things all have very high association with Wharton. And it does turn out that this person is a professor at, uh, at Wharton. So, okay, so let's talk about precision and recall here. So there, there are a few different sets that are important for thinking about precision and recall here. Um, so certainly the, the set of emails that, that actually mention Wharton, at least in this data set, is a, a pretty strong indicator of being about the Wharton Business School. I mean, there are, there are other Whartons in the world, but for this data set, Wharton 
um, generally means the, the Wharton Business School. Uh, but of course there are other emails, as we just saw, there are other emails that are about Wharton but don't have that keyword. And then finally, there are the, the emails that we would find you know, using our, our set of keywords. Um, so, so we'll get some things right, and then there's this yellow region, uh, which I'll label A, that's, that's um, errors. Okay, so, so what, in terms of these sets, what is precision and what's recall? So, so precision is the, the number of emails that we find um, that we should have found, right? So we find A, B, and C, that's the region that we find, and we should have found B and C. And similarly, recall is um, all the emails out there um, uh, that, uh, that we should have found, you know, what fraction did we actually find? So that's B plus C over B <coughs> C plus C. The, the problem here is that we don't, we know A plus B plus C, but we don't know B plus C and we don't know C. So, so the best we could do with precision is actually an underestimate. So we can't calculate B plus C over A plus B plus C, but we can calculate B over A plus B plus C. Um, for recall, also, we weren't, you know, we couldn't evaluate this directly. So, so one sort of approximation that we did is we restricted it to the set B. So of all those emails, and that's actually already 800 emails that contain the keyword Wharton, how many of those would we have found without relying on the keyword Wharton? Um, so that was, that's what we used to get some sense of recall. So here, here's some results. Um, the, the star in the upper right corner is just indicating you know, where you want to be, right? Perfect precision, perfect recall. The, um, the red square, which in the, the left is sort of a baseline, so that's if, if the only keywords you can think of are Wharton and University of Pennsylvania, how do you do? Well, you do pretty well with precision, you get like 75%, uh, but only around 60% recall. So the nice thing about this is that at least we can move closer <laughs> to that star, um, particularly using a mix of the web and email to, to evaluate confidence and move closer. Okay, so, um, so now what? So, so again, the, the natural or a natural question is, you know, you've, you've figured out how to detect this sensitive content. What do you do next? How do you protect it? And I'll, I think I'll get back to that at the end of the talk, assuming there's time. Um, another question, sort of a confession here. The, um, the Valerie claim example was a little bit of a cheat. It does have a high confidence association. Those keywords do have a high confidence association with Greece, but they also have a high confidence association with France. And one thing that we're not doing now is um, really modeling, you know, how a human would, would deal with these, these ambiguities, right? I mean, a, a, a human might say, oh, okay, well, it looks like it's either France or Greece from this information, uh, but later on she complains about how difficult the language is, but that suggests it's Greece or, I don't know, Poland <laughs> or something. And, and then the human might say, well, the most likely answer for this is Greece. Um, and, and that's something we're not doing right now. Okay. Okay, so, so let's, um, let's shift gears then, and I was going to talk a little bit about how you might use this to detect bias. Okay. Okay, um, so again, starting with an example. Um, so this is a, a, a security book, actually a very good security book, uh, by Ross Anderson. You can buy it on Amazon today. This is a screenshot. Um, it's got uh, 27 customer reviews. You can see up there at the, at the top. It's very highly rated right now almost four and a half stars. Okay, so, so the question is, um, well, let me show you some reviews first. This is a, actually the top 10 reviews, or at least the you know, headlines from the top 10 reviews. So, so the question we, we were curious about is, beyond reading the content of these reviews, is there anything quick that you can do to get some sense of uh, how to calibrate these reviews? So, so you know, just from this information, so no content here, um, just the name of the reviewer and, and, and the name of the author, and the title and such, what, what can you say? Well, so do any of these look interesting? Um, okay, well, so it looks like maybe, maybe Ross um, reviewed his own book. Actually, that's pretty <laughs> common, right? A lot of authors review their own books. Um, <coughs> that seems fair game, right? Um, but probably he didn't write a negative review, right? So maybe, okay, so maybe we set that one aside. But what about the other reviewers? Um, well, this person, 
um, has work that's described in this book, and, and they've served on program committees with the author. Um, this person has interviewed the author. Uh, again, this person's work is talked about in this book, and, and the, uh, Ross Anderson has lectured about this person's work, and this person actually helped edit the book. So, so it's not to say that these reviews aren't truthful and aren't accurate, but maybe they're still <coughs> more predictable. Right? Um, because of these external relationships, maybe maybe you'd want to calibrate um, these reviews differently. So, so we were wondering, you know, can, you, can you quickly detect this type of thing? You know, say, um, could you easily find these relationships and, and sort of give you a way to sort through these various reviews? So, so the idea is just to use the technique we were just talking about. Um, if, if a reviewer and author have a, a strong relationship, an external relationship, that may be represented on the web. Um, certainly, if it's a professional rela relationship, if they've written books together, if they've served on program committees together, that's, that's generally on the web, and we might be able to detect it. So, so the algorithm is really just the same thing as before. Um, now we've got a reviewer and an author name, and uh, we're going to issue three queries, three search engine queries, uh, one for the reviewer's name, one for the author's name, and one for the two together. And again, just note the hit counts. Don't look at the content, uh, just the hit counts. And we'll, we'll take two ratios, um, one to measure the strength of the association reviewer applies author, and the other to measure the strength of the association author applies reviewer. And then the maximum of those two will be the, um, the confidence that we associate with uh, that pair. Okay, sort of a, a measure of the, an estimate of the, the strength or presence even of the a relationship. Okay, so going back to those, those uh, reviewers in that first example, so the numbers look pretty low, right? I mean, 0.02. So the ones with boxes are the ones who, who had a relationship with the, the author, and with the exception of Ross, right? He has a strong association with himself. But, um, but everybody else is pretty low. But still, you know, viewing the data in a little a different way, of course, it's a very small data set, but it looks like maybe, um, maybe there's some difference going on. Okay. Um, so we wanted to, I should say, this is, this is very much ongoing work, but we wanted to, um, get some initial sense of how accurate this could be in practice. So we looked at um, the top 300 cryptography books from Amazon. 300 cryptography And that's only the top. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and we, we chose that area because we know a little bit about the community. And it does seem to have a very um, substantial web presence here. Every conference is on the web. Every um, uh, papers are on the web. All the spring books go on there. Yeah, that's like the, uh, the lecture Euro notes, crypt, like crypto, that's right, Asia, that's right. one book. Yeah. They can't, they yeah. their okay. books. Okay. All the proceedings are oh, books, okay. that's right. Okay. So, it adds up. Um, so then we scraped authors and reviewers from books that had at most 20 reviews. And the, the thinking there was that if, we, um, if a book has more than 20 reviews, then it's pretty unlikely that those reviews are dominated by friends of the author. So probably our technique is not so useful. Um, okay, so, so then that got us down to just 64 books. Um, here's some statistics on that, on that small set, about one and a half authors per book, about three and a half reviewers per book, and all told we needed to make a little over 600 queries. So we needed a ground truth too, right? So we reviewed all those pairs to figure out which ones really did have an external relationship. A relationship. Um, we ended up with 20, and I just wanted to to talk a little bit about the range of, uh, of relationships here. Um, some, like people who had written a book together, right, that's pretty strong evidence that they know each other. Um, similarly, if someone acknowledges someone, that's also fairly reasonable evidence, advisor advising as well. But then down at the bottom, there's some that um, I think are pretty weak evidence of a relationship, like um, people who have spoken at the same conference. You know, if it's a big conference, that's no indication whether or not they know each other. But that said, these are the 20 that we decided were, um, were true relationships. These are the 20 that we wanted to be able to find. Right? So our precision and recall is measured against this. Um, so here's, here's how it turned out. If you, um, you know, take the confidence really low, 0 0.001, you can get up to around 90% recall, again, on this, this small data set. Um, we couldn't ever get all the way to 1 because um, we were requiring a minimum web support of 10. 
Because when we went below that, basically the hits were dominated by the Amazon.com hits and just the person's review. So really weren't it, evidence of anything. Um, so so that yeah, so there's a limitation, right? There has to be this um, this web presence. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, going up to about 90% precision with around 35% uh, recall. So again, a very small data set, but it looks like um, that it could work in at least some communities. Um, and I think, I think that's actually an important point. It's not, it's not only that the relationships have to have a web presence. It's also important that the relationship is a substantial portion of one of the party's web presence. Um, so, for example, Sarah Palin, right, and she clearly had a web presence before she ran for <coughs> president, but once she you know, became John McCain's running mate, it, her web presence grew enormously, right? So there's a very strong association there. Um, whereas, another example is Madonna and Guy Ritchie married for many years. You would think, okay, there's a relationship, but it's hard to pick up on the web because she's this huge web presence independent of Guy Ritchie. Okay, so, so yeah, so we're definitely not going to pick up everything this way. Um, the other point, which I think I, I made before, is that, of course, these reviews, you know, they may be very accurate, right? Um, I think more what, what we're saying is that they're more predictable, right? Um, and there does seem to be some evidence of this, that um, people have looked at the average number of stars for Amazon reviews. They get around four stars. Uh, and in our small set of true relationships, we're getting significantly higher, almost 4.8. So these are just more likely to be positive reviews, and so you might want to... Um, maybe um, weight them less because of that. Okay. Um, and then just yeah, finally a couple other comments. Again, the community needs to have strong web presence, so it's not clear how broadly you can use this. Uh, another way to get more value out of it might be by um, just making it a little more sophisticated, right? If I'm on a message board commenting about company A, maybe there is no s association between me and company A, but maybe there is a strong association between me and company B, which is a competitor of company A. And that also right, could be um, very useful for bias. Um, and then, yeah, final comment is that we were just looking for the associations broadly on the web, um, doing no sort of conditioning to get a better signal. But you can. You can very easily get a better signal. If we had just sort of um, you know, conditioned on cryptography, uh, then that ups the association between this reviewer, Avi Rubin, and Ross Anderson almost eight times. Right. So it just gives you a way to sort of um, make sure that your the web hits you're picking up are for the right Ross Anderson and the right Avi Rubin. Okay. Okay. So I think now I'm gonna maybe shift gears again. Unless there were any questions or okay. Okay. So um, so back to the question of um, how can you use this or can you use these types of ideas to better protect content. So we've just been talking about detecting sensitive content. Really haven't said anything about how you how you might want to actually protect it. Um, so, so as a sort of motivating example, um, imagine that there's a, an intelligence analyst who's doing research on, say, that, that plane leak that we were talking about earlier. So you want to be able to make sure that they can access anything that's about the plane leak, but not just read arbitrary Valerie Plane documents, not just you know snoop arbitrarily. So how, how can you distinguish between documents that are about the leak and, and ones that are just about Valerie Plane? Um, well, this is where the inference detection might help. Um, inference detection can potentially take that sensitive topic and quickly give you uh, keywords that are closely associated with it. And some of those documents will be in a Valerie Plame article. Certainly you know, her name, the CIA, might be in there. But there are other terms that are probably aren't going to be. And in this example, it turns out to be this, these people, Novak and Hadley, I think. Uh, but anyway, the, the high-level idea is that you're getting this set of keywords closely associated with your topic, and you might just require that you know, um, there have to be at least 80% of these keywords in the document before you can access it. Because that, you know, so this is a coarse form of topic detection. It gives you some confidence that that document is really about the topic that you want the analyst to access. Okay. So, um, so we, we've developed a, um, an encryption protocol that does this. It actually is more general than what I've described. It can support any Boolean formula on the keywords, but I think the threshold case is kind of the most um, intuitive and good one to keep in mind. Um, for those who've 
heard of attribute-based encryption. This is a form of that. Um, where we're particularly interested in attributes that are um, keywords. So, so what I thought I'd do is um, <coughs> talk about this, the protocol at a very high level. So, so the slides that I have in the, the main deck won't give you, I mean, you wouldn't be able to go away and you know, write down um, the, the actual protocol. They just kind of try and motivate it at a high level. But if that doesn't make things clear, or if you're curious, I do have a concrete example later on. Okay. So, okay, so how, how will we do this? How will we control access based on topic? Um, so one thought is we could um, associate an, an encryption key with each possible user access right. So I apologize, this is not showing up very well, but um, so, so maybe one access right is, um, you know, this person can see any content as long as it's not about playing or rove. So, okay, so we create a key for that um, and, uh, and we associate it with that access right. Uh, another access right could be any content about plane, as long as it's not about rope, you know, et cetera, right? So for all the access rights, we create keys and we associate those keys with them. So, so this is good for the user, right? The user has some particular access right. Now they only have to store one key. But when we uh, go to encrypt the content, a particular piece of content may satisfy many different access rights. So it could mean a lot of um, overhead on that side. Okay. so. So why don't we try again and maybe start with the content. So instead, let's look at um, um, a particular document. Maybe the first three paragraphs happen to be about Plame and Rove, but not Wilson. So again, we'll create a key to associate with that content, and we'll encrypt the paragraphs accordingly. Um, and then these other paragraphs, they're about Plame and Wilson, but not Rove, so they need a new key, and we encrypt again. Okay, so this is looking better on the document side, less overhead, um, less, less keys to, to add on. Um, but for a user now, um, a user's access right may require them to store many different keys. So maybe we just sort of shifted the problem to the, the other end. So, so as you might expect, what we do is kind of in between the, the two. Um, we, we create a key for each tag, where a tag may be a keyword or the negation of a keyword. So, for example, there's the flame key, there's the not flame key, the robe key, the not robe key, etc. And then to, to encrypt the text, um, we'll, we'll just generate a um, you know, random symmetric key, whatever, you, whatever your favorite cipher is, AES, for example. Um, and, and so we'll encrypt under that AES key. So here's a paragraph that's about, say, flame and robe. Okay, so great, we generate an AES key. Well, there's, you can't read this, but uh, so now it's encrypted. Um, but we don't, we don't stop there. We also will append the keys associated with those keywords. So this is, again, about flame and rove. So we encrypt it, and we append those keys, the flame and the rove key. Okay. So the ciphertext is that triple. It's the, the actual encrypted content and, and those um, tag-associated keys. Okay. Um, so what happens at the user's end? So maybe the <coughs> easiest way to see that is with... Um, a particular access right. So say I'm the user who um, is allowed to see anything as long as it's both about claim and about rove. So what does this user store? Well, the user is going to store this AES key that they need to, to get the content, but they're going to store it in encrypted form. So again, this is a high-level description, but um, the idea is that the AES key is going to get broken into shares, two pieces in this case, because there are two keywords in their access right. And they really need, the user needs both of these pieces to recover the AES key. And again, this is where the sort of high-level description kind of breaks down, because just having one piece tells you nothing about the AES key. And this diagram doesn't really capture that, but, but okay. So they have these pieces, and they're encrypted under the tag um, keys in their access right. So they're encrypted under the plain key. One's encrypted under the plain key, and one is encrypted under the rogue key. Okay. So, so now, this is what the user stores, just those, um, those two, a ciphertext of the sort of two components. I'm sorry, a key with two components. Um, so what does the user do when the user gets that, that ciphertext up there? Well, they can pull out that plain key and that rove key, and decrypt their, their pieces of the AES key, combine them, and apply them to the content and recover it. So, so you might say, well, this looks like a one-time scheme, though, right? Because once I see a paragraph that's about plain, I've got the plain key, and I'm good forever. Um, and that, again, that's, that's where the high-level description sort of 
um, fails you, right? Because uh, what we do is, is a little more complicated than this. Um, we actually do randomize the whole process. So you're not actually getting the plain key, you're getting a randomized version of the plain key that will only work on that particular paragraph. So it gives you no advantage in decrypting another paragraph about planes. Um, so but maybe the main takeaway here is that the encryption overhead now grows with the number of tags, not with the number of access rights. Let me go back. Um, so again, the, the keys that we're adding on here are, are, are corresponding to the number of tags in the region. Um, and similarly, the, um, the user storage grows with the complexity of their access rights. Again, with, not with the number of access rights. So I, I think it very much depends on the particular setting which you're trying to use this and what the access rights are going to look like. But this could do you know, a fair amount better than either of those naive schemes. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up at this point. Um, so you know, we've talked about how to how to use the web or another large corpus to um, find associations between keywords and between keywords and sensitive topics, and talked about how that might be used for bias detection, and then also how it might support um, access control. So I'll just stop there, but I. You know, let me know if you have questions or, or if anybody wanted to see a concrete example of that encryption protocol, I can do that too. If you apply your yeah. methodology to one of the earlier examples, mm -hmm. how does it fare? I can apply my methodology to it. Well, um, if you use it to do, say, for redacting, how, how much better do you do than oh, oh, the, good. The, the old way? Right. Good, good question. So. First of all, is it sort of manageable? Does it get, uh, is there too Does it much? Does it redact like too much? Yeah. For example, is there anything left? <laughs> right. <laughs> I could redact the whole thing. That's right, that's right. So, yeah, so I think it probably <coughs> looks the best if you're thinking about something like medical records, where, you know, there are fields, like one field might list all the medications the person's on. Right. Yeah, so, so we can take out less. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, when it's, when it's unstructured text, I'm trying to think, do we, do we have any experiments that can speak to that? Um, we, we actually have some work going on right now where we're, we are trying to get exactly that type of, um, get, at, get at that type of question, where we've, we've used these types of techniques to help someone um, sanitize a document. Yeah. It's just a, a little different in that they're not just redacting, but they sometimes are revising the text. Ah, um, no, and that then, is different. And that it is different. Yeah, it is different. Right. Um, yes, yes, yes. But, but that, and that may be that may give you good benefits. You yes. You may, you there may be something left. <laughs> yes, yes. But the interesting thing there is that it, even that is pretty darn hard. So, that, so then what we do is we take the sanitized text and, and have people try and guess who it's about. Um, and in a lot of cases, they can do that. <laughs> you know, yes, you should know. Guessing um, mechanisms, your inference mechanisms. Well, they, they, we allow them to use the web. Yeah, so anything. They are, they are probably doing, yeah. And um, so it's just a really, it's a hard problem. <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about error propagation. Um, so some of the inferences are based on hit counts from searches, and that's an inexact science because of many reasons, including duplicates yes. and things of that sort. Yeah. So if you have an error bar of a certain size in the hit count coming back, how does that propagate to the end result of the system? Right. Does it magnify? Does it shrink? What's the... Or is it even predictable? Yeah. yeah. So it's a real story? problem. Google is just way too smart for us, basically. I mean, Google is trying to understand what this query is about, right? We just want, it. We just want an index. <laughs> we just want to know how many documents match. And Google will do things like look for synonyms and all sorts of clever things, right, that, that can make our results go in unpredictable directions. So, yeah, I don't know if there's a simple answer to what it does to the results. I mean, I think sometimes it's giving us hit counts that are too high. Sometimes it's giving us hit counts that it could even be too low. Um, and, and the amount of error varies significantly. So, I mean, it's just, it's, um, it's something we're struggling with of how to, how to deal with the fact that, that Google is really addressing a different problem than what we are, what we're going after. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good question. It's our big question. <laughs> so, so you're kind of using Google or more generally web search as a black box that gives you these two counts right. in general. 
Uh, what would you ideally then uh, replace that function with if you could have your own best function for that? Right. We just want to know how many, I mean, at this stage, what we think we just want to know is how many documents have those keywords. You know, we don't, we don't want the search engine to be trying to anticipate what we're really looking for. But you do, some, I guess, wouldn't you do sort of some fancy stuff like stemming and... That's true. That's true. No, you're right. Um, case normalization. That's right. That's right. I am oversimplifying. I am oversimplifying. Yeah, I mean, if, it, if, there's, if it's a plural form of something, we want this you know, singular as well. Um, but, but synonyms and things like that, at, at least now, I mean, we, it, I think there probably is a way to take advantage of that, but we don't know how to take advantage of it. So right now it's just confusing for that algorithm. You just need to like 10 documents to make it work, right? In some sense, to get the terms. So it's, it, um, I mean, it occurs to my mind that maybe there is a way to use collaborative filtering. So mm -hmm. we could just look at the own database that you have of other records and get some sample, maybe not using a very clever algorithm, but ask a human to put a number of documents that are related and a number mm -hmm. of documents that are not related and then infer from that. <laughs> Yeah, there probably are extensions like that. And it, I, I think it's a good point that, that there we really are benefiting from Google Smarts, right? The fact that those 10 documents are, are giving us really all we need. I mean, that's, that's showing the ranking algorithm working, right? Those are relevant mm -hmm. documents. But, but yeah, you're right. Maybe collaborative filtering is a good... Because 10 documents is not that hard. Like, for instance, if you look at, for instance, a, uh, a lawsuit and people are trying to find documents that match and documents that do not match, um, there is going to be a human uh, looking through it, and if they can do it by putting 10, doc ten documents in, in the yes bucket and 10 documents in the no bucket, that's a huge... Um, right, right. Uh, where, where are you getting the number 10 from? Well, because she mentioned that if you get 10 good documents... Um, Experimentally, it looks like being, you know, tapers yeah. off. Yeah, we were yeah. getting diminished returns after okay. 10. But, yeah. it's, it's a size of a problem that a human can, can handle, right? That's right. Which means we can be dealt with by humans and not mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. but ultimately. Yeah. After the yeah. ultimately. Just, to infer, just to infer the magical terms, right? Mm -hmm. And then it might be less error prone than, than using a search engine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good point. But if humans were to do it, it would be too expensive. No, no, no. They just collect the original. No, after you've collected it. Yeah, yeah, no. Right, right. Yeah. They just to train the algorithm. One more question. Um, I can imagine that one, one demand for such a system, an inference system, is, okay, I have a redacted data set, and I want to make sure that these medical records for, for research purposes really don't have any personally identifying information. But I don't actually have the names of the people. I just want to say, hey, is there any personally identifying information in here? But I don't actually know it comes from Bob and Joe. And right. You don't know your sensitive topic. That's sort of what you're saying. Right. right. You don't know what you're So if I understood correctly, this research does not address that particular um, need, or, or do you have anything to say on, on, for that sort of problem? Right. Um, well, we, we've done some separate work um, on, say, looking at the U.S. Census data and trying to figure out how identifying um, attributes are there. Like, um, you've probably heard these statistics about 85% um, or some surprisingly large number of people are identifiable just based on their date of birth, their gender, and their zip code. So, so we've done some experiments along those lines, um, but that's more just, you know, it's a structured database, you just mine it, look how many records you're getting. It, um, it's, it doesn't seem, for the, some of that information, it doesn't seem so useful to use the web. Um, am I getting it? I'm not sure if I'm getting it here. Sure, you're saying that the, infer the doing sort of a general inference engine is just do the do statistics and and maybe the general inference stuff is not not what you so need. appropriate. Yeah, well, so but you're you remind me of other stuff. So um, right now we're also looking at um, preference data. So I don't know if you've seen there are a lot of um, uh, there seems to be this movement towards doing authentication based on preference data. So you know when you log into a website and you get asked um, to set up challenge questions. And, and um, folks are, are conjecturing that maybe if you use preferences, that's something that people will find more easy to remember later on. You know, do you like Italian food? You know, oh, yeah, yeah, I like Italian food. <laughs> you know, that it's more constant over time, and you might be more likely to remember it than um, whatever you put down as your best friend in high school or, you know, whatever. Um, so so the one question there is, you know, how, 
how unique are those preferences to you? And that's a place where techniques closer to this, I think, could be useful, where you know, mining the web can tell you, you know, how often do people talk about Italian food and um, Greek food or, you know, <laughs> something. Um, so, yes, I mean, that's, that's certainly not a medical record scenario, but um, an extension. I missed something about your uh, Enron Wharton example. What was the actual scenario there? So Enron would write would like not to. I, I missed right. it. Right. Yeah, you probably missed it because it sounds very artificial, and it is. Um, so, so the the scenario was that um, that that Enron has all these emails, and for some reason they've decided they don't want to reveal that they um, have negotiations with Wharton. Um, and so they're wondering what keywords they should be looking for to decide if an email is about um, is about Wharton. And um, does that make sense? Or so um, I guess my question really is probably orthogonal to the actual oh. technical aspects of this work. Just out of curiosity, would they be able to then say? in response to discovery or whatever legal action is, mm. would they be able to say, well, we'd rather not disclose these emails? Is that even? It's an interesting question. So apparently, um, there is a bit of a negotiation you know, as part of the discovery process as to what keywords to look for. Mm -hmm. um, so right, so everybody's got a huge number of documents, and they've decided these certain topics are within scope, and they have to be produced. Um, how do they find those documents? And the, both parties will agree on, okay, these are the relevant keywords. So, so maybe we could help support that. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So the subpoena is not just for all of your email? Apparently, in some cases, they do negotiate keywords to look for. Because it's a lot of work even on, on the recipient's end, right? I mean, they get this stuff. You know, it's a, sort of a denial of service attack, right, between these parties, right? They're going to slow down the other side because they have to go through all of these documents. So there is some motivation, I think, on both sides to call a list, both to hide things and to make it easier. But the documents are all available, aren't they? The, the emails. I mean, there's a and database with all the emails. You used it. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. We're just talking more generally in litigation, you know, um, how much do you produce? If the subpoena is for all your email, it's pretty easy. To then it's, there's no problem. There's right. No but sometimes we will come back and say, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's too much. That's that's discrimination too lawsuit, right? Yeah. You don't you don't get to see you know my emails about um, the AFL draft or whatever you know <laughs> you know you, you're not going to get to see everything and the and the judge will say it has too broad a request and then another question about scenarios so in the very last part uh, with the topic stuff um, is the idea there that uh, you would have um, let's say in a classified setting with different levels of analysts or different you know you'd have the open source analyst and you'd have like the is that the scenario? That's right. You know all about this stuff, right? A little bit. So that's, that's what that's saying, that, or that sort of thing? And is there also right. kind of a, um, a commercial world well, uh, aspect? Actually, well, so it did, it did come um, from actually a Xerox client, that the motivation for constructing that thing, because um, there was a mortgage company that was, that was saying, well, we've got these loan documents, and this is, of course, back when people were getting mortgages, so <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> they were like, you know, a thousand pages or something, apparently, in these applications, and they had separation of duty in their organization, so that not everybody could see, they didn't want everybody to see everything, uh, but they didn't want to maintain multiple copies of these, these loan documents redacted differently for each oh, person. So then that seems to sound like, you know, encryption and, mm -hmm. and yeah. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thank you.